Um, good morning. Let's begin uh, with our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Justin Martyr, pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome back to our class this morning. We're continuing the Acts of the Apostles. Now, as you can see in the map, now Paul, remember he was in Berea, okay? Berea is right here at the top, right here. And then the people in Berea, the Jewish people in the Berea were very acceptive of the gospel. You know, unlike the Jews in Thessalonica, those Jews in Thessalonica, they're very anti or against Paul and the gospel message. Uh, so, you know, Paul had to leave Thessalonica, uh, only, you know, converting many of the Gentiles. But when he goes to Berea, um, the Jewish community there, they're very open to the gospel. There are actually people who lived, you know, according to the scriptures. So, you know, listening to uh, Paul's, you know, speech and sermons, they actually go back to the Old Testament and they actually realize that Paul was telling them the truth. In fact, that the Messiah had to suffer, you know, had to die, but then had to be raised on the third day by God and, and resurrect. So, so they were accepting Paul's message in the gospel. But the Jews in Thessalonica heard what was happening in Berea. So they came to Berea and started causing more problems, right? So Paul had to run away all the way down to Athens, okay? So Athens, there's a yellow star around it. So he went really, really far to Athens, okay? And that's where he's going to talk about, you know, Jesus again to the Athenians, okay? Um, Paul, uh, Silas and Timothy, actually, they remained in Berea, right? But Paul wants to, you know, bring them to where he is, okay? So we are continuing uh, chapter 17 from verse 16 to 21. We'll read together. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Okay, so let's uh, look at some of the commentaries. So first, um, before we go into the commentary, sorry, we'll talk about a little bit about Athens, okay? So as we know, Athens, of course, is the capital and the largest city of Greece and is one of the oldest uh, cities in the world. Um, its recorded uh, history goes over um, 3,400 years or so, and they found the earliest human presence there uh, somewhere between 1200 and 8000 BC. So that's a long, long, long time, right? 
But when we look at the classical Athens, meaning Athens during the olden days, it was still a very powerful city state. Okay, so uh, back then Athens was actually its own state or own country. Okay, and it was center for the arts, learning, and philosophy. It was home of Plato's Academy and Aristotle's uh, Lyceum. That was a temple, you know, uh, dedicated to Jupiter or, or um, and it was also referred to as the cradle of Western civilization. And it was birthplace of democracy, right? Now, many people ask, where does the name Athens come from? Was it named after the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom? Or did the goddess take the name from the city? Um, there's a lot of debate accordingly, um, but uh, modern scholars seems to agree, generally agree, that it was actually the goddess who was named after the city, okay? And of course, Athena is the, um, what do you call it? The patron goddess of the city of Athens, okay? All right, so, so I'll show a little bit pictures of Athens. First of all, this is Acropolis of Athens. Acropolis basically means a city center or that is up on the hill, okay? So up on the hill, you see the remains of some old buildings, okay? This is seen from Mount Lycabetus, okay? Now, another picture of the same Acropolis, okay? Seen from Hills of Muses, okay? You see the, all these old ruins, okay? So it's on top of the hill, right? So Acropolis means city on top of a hill. And what is that huge building at the top? That's the Parthenon, okay? Or that is the temple of Athena, okay? So this is like one of the biggest temples they could find dedicated to goddess Athena because people of Athens, of course, they worshiped uh, wisdom and Athena is a goddess of wisdom. Okay, and this is uh, remains of, of a theater, a theater of Dionysius or Dionysus, okay? Once again, it was built in a way that if you sit on these, you know, uh, sitting area, you could hear the voices very well. They didn't have microphones or speakers, but you know, the seating was you know created in and made in a, such an angle that the sound travels in an angle, and they were able to hear you know clearly what the actors or speakers were saying. This is one of my famous favorite, I should say, favorite places in Athens. I mean. I don't like the temple. I don't like all these, you know, theaters. What I like is this prison, you know. Why do I like this prison? Because this is the prison of Socrates. We believe that this is where Socrates was in prison. And of course he was executed. He had to drink poison, right? Because the accused, Athenians accused Socrates for corrupting the youth with wrong ideas. And of course, Socrates is one of the greatest thinkers and philosophers in ancient Greece. And I personally, I really do like Socrates. So yeah, my favorite place, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, as we go. But going back to the Acts of the Apostles, okay? So now Paul is in Athens. Paul arrives in Athens and he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to join him, okay? He's waiting for them to join him. And while he was waiting them, he's seeing all these things happening in Athens and he's quite you know, upset, why? Because there's so much paganism, right? There's so many idols, right? Okay, so here from verse 16 to 21, we see how it's the gospel's first encounter with Hellenist paganism, okay? Hellenists mean Greek paganism, right? Greeks believed in these gods and goddesses, right? On Mount Olympus, remember? There's Zeus, um, Hera, Zeus's wife, Hades, Poseidon, Artemis, um, 
what's the name of Apollo, right? Apollo is a sun god who, who's also called Jupiter by, by Romans, the, the, that's a Latin name, but Apollo and of course Athena, Hermes, right? You name it, all these, you know, pagan gods, you know, they were very into this, right? It was very popular and also it was very intellectual, okay, in some ways. And this, you know, incident is, is an important episode because it shows how we can spread the Christian message, Jesus's message, the gospel of Jesus in a, in a different setting, in a different atmosphere. Until now, as we remember, see, Paul was primarily still talking to the Jews first. Of course. of course, he was talking to the Gentiles, but he was primarily, you know, preaching in the synagogues, okay? And, and even the Gentiles living in these certain cities, they were people who, who lived with Jews, and they kind of understood who the Jews were, what they believed. So they, they heard about Moses, they heard about God, you know? But here is very different. Like, there are no Jews here, right? It's very Hellenistic very pagan, very different outlook, different culture, okay? So this is really first time that Paul is really trying to spread the good news of Jesus to a non-Jew audience, okay? And very pagan, very different, you know? And Paul does it in a way that, that it's not that he's watering down the gospel, but he's doing it in a way that he's kind of you know, trying to make it easier for the listeners to understand the message of Jesus, the message of the good news of the gospel, while still remaining completely faithful to itself. And, and this is really important because this is how the church continues to spread the gospel to many different cultures and and nations in the world, because there are lots of different cultures and there's lots of different, you know, understanding and practices and beliefs. But somehow without losing the true meaning of the gospel, you know, we can still spread the good news, okay? By the time that Paul was in Athens though, it was no longer the brilliant intellectual capital. Like, in time of Plato and Aristotle, okay? So he was in decline, both culturally and politically, okay? But it still retained traces of its former glory, its uh, philosophical currents of the day, and intellectual debate was always welcome, right? But I wanna speak a little bit about this decline. I want to say that, you know, just by looking at the prison of Socrates, the greatest thinker, like I think he was the greatest thinker ever in, in Greek philosophy. What do they do to him? See, the problem with Socrates is if you have read his, his books written by Plato, okay, Plato is uh, Socrates' his disciple. And see, there was an oracle in Delphi. I don't know if you have heard of it. In Delphi, there was this oracle that prophesies all these things. And apparently this oracle said that the wisest man on earth was Socrates. But Socrates didn't believe it. He said, no, 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 it can't be me. I can't be the wisest person. You know, there must be many others who are much more wiser than I. So Socrates goes to Athens, you know, the marketplaces and all these different areas. And he starts to, you know, talk with all these famous philosophers and politicians and people with knowledge. And, and, and Socrates, you know, gets into, you know, dialogue with him and he starts to ask them questions. And during these, you know, debate or discussion, Socrates proves that all these people who so claim that they know something actually don't know because they're not able to answer a lot of Socrates' questions. And actually Socrates actually proves 
that he's actually wiser than many of these so-called wise men. So what happened was Socrates became, you know, a victim of jealousy. All these intellectuals and powerful people in Athens did not like Socrates because he publicly humiliated them. Okay? Because Socrates proved that they were not that smart. So what happens? They blame him as a scapegoat, saying that all the bad things happening to Athens is the fault of Socrates. And they, you know, falsely accuse him, false trial, you know, and they execute him. And Socrates dies. And you could kind of see how if Athens or the people of Athens were going to treat one of the greatest thinkers like this, of course they're going to go into decline. Okay? They don't care about what is the right thing, what is the just thing. They don't talk about you know, philosophy. They don't talk about what is you know, the intelligent thing or reason or what is logical. They're all going into these paganism, superstitions and yeah, of course, it's, it's going to go downstream. The funny thing, though, is that so when, when I went to pilgrimage in Turkey and Greece in the footsteps of St. Paul, and we actually came to Athens, it was no different. It was no different because I'll say this much. So on the way to the Temple of Athena, you know, we went to the top and you know, the temple of Athena was full of tourists and we're one of them too, of course, but we're, they were full of tourists, full, full, full of tourists. Everybody was there taking pictures, etc., 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 et buying souvenirs. Of course, like things like, you know, you know little uh, trinkets of Athena, the goddess and all these different things. Anyway, so after our tour of, the temple we were making our way down and someone uh, our guy told me you know on the way down if you go to the right you'll see the prison of Socrates so what what, what did I do I start running yeah I started running I started running 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 okay and all the people were like oh there where are you going I'm just running 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 by myself and I came to the prison of Socrates. And guess what? No one was there. Not even one person. Zero. On the top of the hill, where there's pagan goddess, which is not even real, all this superstition, and people are swarming. And in front of the prison of Socrates, one of the greatest thinkers, philosophers, Nobody there, nobody there. So I was really uh, upset, actually. I was very disappointed because I think most of us, we don't care about philosophy. We don't care about what is the right thing, you know? A lot of us, we're just thinking about all these, you know, superstitions and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm, I'm being a little bit sidetracked, but I kind of felt the same way, same way that St. Paul felt. I really understood how St. Paul felt when he was in Athens. People were into all these paganism and idols and superstitions. They're not being smart, okay? So the gospel was presented to the pagan philosophers as true philosophy. You know, St. Paul's trying to tell them, look, I know you guys are good at philosophy and knowledge and all these things, but here's a true philosophy. That's the Jesus Christ. He's the Logos. He's the word of God. He's, you know, and without diminishing the transcendental aspect of the gospel. So see, the gospel is not just philosophy because philosophy is knowledge, but it's more about human knowledge. You know, for example, when we say philosophy, it's, it's acquiring knowledge from our point of view, human point of view. So we call it the bottom to top kind of knowledge. So we, we, we learn knowledge and we move up. So we go upward. 
And philosophy is very different from theology because theology is love of God, uh, theos, God, logi, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, uh, it's a study of God, okay? And, and theology is totally different from philosophy because it's coming from up to down. It comes from God to down. The knowledge comes from God. The source of knowledge is God and it goes down to us. So theology is top to bottom. Philosophy is bottom to top. Sources us and we go towards the top. But of course, philosophy has its limits because human knowledge have limits. Human brain has limits. So there are certain things that is very difficult for us to know. That is why we say God reveals himself. How could ever would we as human beings ever come to a conclusion that God is Trinity? We will never because it's very difficult. It's very difficult for us to comprehend. Only when God was able to tell us himself that, hey, by the way, I'm God and I'm Trinity. Then we said, oh, okay. It doesn't make sense to us. We don't understand it. However, it must be because it's God who told us that he's Trinity. Okay? He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He told us. Now, whether we accept it or not is our, is our choice. But see, this is theology. It's revelation. God telling us who he is. However, without, even without theology, we could still think about who God is. We could think God as he must be the most perfect being. He's the most just being. He's the most beautiful being because he must be that because he's God. God must be perfect. God must be all knowing. God must be most beautiful. Okay, so we, we, can, we could kind of think about God that way and, and approach it from our point of view. But once again, theology, it comes from God. So what this is saying is that even though Paul is trying to talk to these, you know, philosophers, Greek philosophers in Athens, in, in their kind of approach, you know, approaching God from human knowledge. But at the same time, he's saying that he's not losing that theology, the sense of theology that is from God. The source is God, okay? Transcendental, meaning it goes beyond our world, our knowledge, our, our dimension, it, it transcends it, okay? And it is supernatural, why? Because it's divine, it comes from God. So the point at which they coincide is that philosophy is the science of life, the study of life, okay? Philosophy, you study about everything. You know, biology, chemistry, physics, all is part of philosophy. Okay, now we, we divided it so much because each, each you know, um, uh, area is, is so sophisticated and needs its own attention. But, you know, all the natural sciences and mathematics belong to philosophy. It was all falls under philosophy. And, um, yeah, it's actually study of life, science of life. And it is a legitimate search for the answer to profound questions about human existence. For example, why are we here? Why were we created? Why were we born? What is our purpose? So even back then, all these philosophers were trying to figure it out. Why are we here? What's our, what's our destiny? What's the purpose? What's our goal? You know? So that's what they're studying. And Paul is trying to talk with them. And he tries to lead them beyond that intellectual curiosity, just the human intellectual curiosity. Because sometimes philosophy and all these debates and arguments um, can become something like of a, of a game, okay? So it's not really about, you know, trying to find the truth. It's about trying to find the best argument so that you could beat everybody in the debate. Unfortunately, it kind of becomes like that. That is why it's very difficult and dangerous for us to always debate and argue about faith because once again, there's a, there's a side to philosophical debates and arguments that becomes a, a game, really. It really does become a game. It's all about winning the argument. It's not about finding the truth, okay? And people get upset. Remember Socrates? He was killed because all these people 
were sore losers, okay? They were not really you know, trying to find the truth. They were more concerned about their reputation, you know, and their popularity, because all these thinkers, great thinkers, so-called, you know, you know, had all these students who paid lots of money to study under them. But when Socrates, you know, kind of beat them in their in the debate, guess what happened to all the students? They all went to Socrates. Yeah, yeah, you know. So sometimes it's not about finding the truth. It's just about winning the argument. It's about getting reputation or popularity. So Paul tries to lead them beyond the intellectual curiosity to the genuine search for the perennial truth, okay? which then therefore becomes more religious, okay? It becomes more religious because religion, once again, is not a game, it's not a debate, it's not arguments, you know? It, it, religion is, is more sincere than that because we are really trying to answer the deep questions of our existence, you know, the truth of our life, you know, that's why Paul starts to lead these, you know, philosophers to the true religion. Paul still supports the philosophers in their criticism of superstition. Yes, you know, uh, philosophers were a little bit different. They weren't uh, into popular, you know, beliefs and superstitions that most common people had. So the philosophers were trying to lead people away from these false understanding of gods and, you know, things like that, and trying to make them understand more, become more scientific into these terms, right? However, Paul is telling these philosophers, you know, that their efforts trying to negate or deny or reject all these, you know, falsehood is not good enough. It's not good enough. What Paul is saying is we need to try to find the real truth, the real truth. And of course, for Paul, the real truth is Jesus Christ. Although Paul does understand very well that Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. Why? Because try to explain to, to a young boy or young girl that Jesus is a superhero because he, because he died on the cross. It, it doesn't make sense because if you're a superhero, you don't die on the cross. You're supposed to fight and, and beat all the bad guys. But see, the crucifixion of Jesus is, is really difficult for a lot of people to accept because it's embarrassment, it's, it's, it's a failure, you see, it's a failure. So it is very difficult for us to understand this. And that's why he says it's a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. At the same time, Paul, while he's trying to, you know, preach the gospel to these philosophers, he does express some respect and, um, you know, and some um, you know, openness to, to pagan thought and religion. Because see, Paul does not see paganism or philosophy as, how should I say, an opposition to the gospel. He rather sees it as, um, as a kind of a groundwork preparation for the gospel, okay? So um, it's very important for us to remember that we need to uh, keep always, you know, that anything that is good, okay, anything that is good can lead us to, to God, okay? So, and I, I really find that this is, this is important because even, other religions, okay, the church, Catholic Church has declared that all major religions in the world do have some truth and goodness, okay? So we need to respect that and, 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 and accept that there, that there are some goodness. But of course, the fullness of the truth, the fullness of goodness, resides in Jesus Christ and his church, which is the Catholic church, right? So we believe that, you know, all these people, if they follow what is good and what is true, 
they will eventually, hopefully, come to the truth of Jesus Christ and his church, the Catholic Church, right? That's what we, we believe and that's what we're trying to do. So don't have this attitude that people with different religions are our enemies, that somebody that we have to go and beat up or destroy, no. Think of them as brothers and sisters, okay, because they're all children of God, whether they accept it or not. But we need to help them to come to the fullness of truth. You know, fullness of truth. It's not easy, of course, it's not easy. But at least for us, we need to have this kind of attitude because this is, this is the Holy Spirit, you know, speaking to Paul, you know. This is the Holy Spirit, you know, working, you know, through Paul, giving us an important lesson how the church and how Christians, you know, should approach, you know, other people, other cultures, or other religion. Once again, it's not to say that, you know, people don't have to become Christians. No, we want, we want everybody to become Christian. We wish that everybody will become a Christian. We wish that everybody will accept Jesus. We pray that, that they will all recognize Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We do, but not in a way that we look at them as our enemies or somebody that we have to destroy. No, somebody that we have to encourage and we have to, you know, uh, pray for, okay? Even, you know, even limited or secular culture. We need to try to remember that if it is good, there's something good in it, we need to, you know, promote it in some ways and support it. It just my side kind of um, input. I don't know if you if you've heard, but it seems like um, there, there's a growing popularity of Korean pop culture. Um, Korean drama, Korean music, and I think one of the biggest uh, uh, groups right now is BTS, for example. I don't know if you've heard of BTS, but if you ask your grandchildren, they'll tell you who BTS is, right? Um, why? Why is that? Why, why are young people, our youth, opening up to the Korean culture? Is it because Korean culture is better? No. It's, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm Korean background. So yeah, I love my own Korean culture, but is it better than anybody else's culture? No, of course not. But why are young people, you know, opening up to Korean cultures? In my opinion, in my opinion, it's because first of all, Korean music, especially if you listen to the lyrics of BTS's music, for example, is very positive. There's a lots of positive messages there. And it does not talk about drugs. It does not talk about gangsters. It does not talk about killing somebody. It does not talk about promiscuity or you know, having sex and all these different things. It does not talk about that. It talks about love. It talks about friendship. It talks about you know, all these nice, important things of life. And I think that is why a lot of young people are, are, are going to Korean music and Korean dramas because once again, I mean, of course, there's some violent Korean movies and things like that, but generally Korean dramas, it, it doesn't have a lot of nudity. It does not have all these, you know, adult themes or drugs and crime and death. You know, it, it's mostly talking about friendship, life, family, love. And I think, you know, it's important that our young people, they grew up watching and listening to these positive message. Yes, it's secular, it's nothing to do with religion. It doesn't have God in there. Yes, it's true, but there's some goodness in that. On contrary, I was, I was watching a, a show on, on Netflix and, and this is Amer it was an American show. I was watching it for five minutes and I couldn't watch it anymore because it was too violent. It was too vulgar. It was too nasty. And I sometimes wonder, why do I need Watch this. Why do we need all these violence and nudity and all these cursing? And why do we have to have it? 
I'm not trying to say that, you know, there's no evil in this world. I'm not trying to blind eye to that. No, like our world is full of corruption and evil that we have to get rid of. Yes, but at the same time, why do I have to watch these shows? And it's unnecessary. I find it is unnecessary, you know. And I think that is why we need to promote good culture, not just Korean culture, but good culture, culture that has a positive message, that has some goodness in it. And we have to teach our children to, to go to those cultures, you know? And I'm glad, I'm hoping that there's going to be a shift that most other artists and many other, you know, people in media in different parts of the world will start to understand, oh yeah, you know what? Drugs and sex and violence doesn't sell anymore. It doesn't sell anymore, okay? I hope they understand that. And, and I hope that they can also promote more goodness and, and innocence and love and family, you know, in our, in our popular media and popular, uh, popular culture, because that helps us to talk about God. It helps us to talk about Jesus. It helps us talk about the gospel, okay? Continuing, uh, St. Gregory Nisa, he writes, there are in profane culture aspects which should not be rejected when the time comes to grow in virtue. Natural moral philosophy can in fact be the companion of one who wants to lead a higher life provided that its fruit does not carry any alien contamination. So he's just basically saying that even not even like, you know, popular culture, excuse me, sorry, popular culture or philosophy and things like that. If it helps us, okay, to become a better person, to become, you know, a better Christian, we should not, of course, reject it. But we have to be careful that it does not carry any alien contamination. For example, um, I know most people would say like, you know, there are a lot of, you know, these breathing exercises and breathing, you know, techniques or these a lot of um, um, uh, energy uh, healing things and even uh, most popular things is yoga, for example, you know, a lot of people think is they say, oh, it's safe, it's safe. Um, however, there's some aspects of yoga and all these, you know, breathing exercises and things like that, that we need to be a little bit careful is because yes, breathing is good. Exercise, breathing exercise is good itself. Uh, yoga stretches and all these things are good itself, but it does sometimes contain aspects. Once again, I think I mentioned sometime before, but they bring their own philosophy. And this philosophy is mostly based on their religious beliefs. So for example, yoga is, is based on Hinduism. So it does talk about chakras, energy, and, and all these you know, gateways that you have to open yourself to the universe. So when you try to, I mean, when you kind of get into that kind of philosophy or belief system where you have to open yourself up to the universe, um, and when they say universe can mean anything, um, and, and, and there's a danger that you could actually open yourself for things that you don't want to open yourself to, like you don't want to be open to evil or the devil, right? So you got to be really bit careful about these things. Now, of course, I know there's some yoga classes that don't talk about philosophy and things like that. It's simply, simply, purely, you know, physical stretching and things like that. Then that's fine. But um, it's very difficult to separate the two because in every yoga, you know, moves, if you could call it, sometimes uh, they have these postures that they say, oh, you're opening up yourself to the universe and Mother Earth or all these different energy sources. And I think as Christians, I think we need to be a little bit careful about that. So it's just a warning. I'm not saying that it's evil or it's bad or anything like that, but we as Christians, we need to be a little bit careful that, that we, we don't approach all these, you know, philosophies and open ourselves up too much, okay? So anything alien to us, we gotta be aware, okay? And be wary, okay? 
St. Justin Martyr, our patron saint, he also wrote about merits and defects of uh, pagan philosophy, okay? And the relative truth it contains, okay? So he says, I declare that I prayed and strove with all my might to be known as a Christian, not because the teaching of Plato are completely different from those of Christ, but because they are not in all respects the same. Neither are those of other writers, Stoics, the poets, and the historians. For each discoursed rightly, seeing through his participation in the seminal divine word what related to it, but that have uttered contrary opinions clearly do not have sound knowledge and infutable wisdom. Whatever has been uttered or right by any man in any place belongs to Christians. For next to God, we worship and love the word, which is from the unbegotten and ineffable God. All the profane authors were able to see the truth clearly through the seed of reason, logos or word, implanted in them. So same as St. Gregory, St. Justin is also saying that the reason why he's a Christian is not because he's saying that anybody or all the other religions or all other philosophers or all the other writers that they're all wrong. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, but, but he's a Christian because Jesus is different from all these other thinkers and writers and religious leaders Okay, because Jesus is unique. His message is very unique. And yes, Jesus does have some agreement with some of these you know, religious leaders like Buddha, for example. But still, Jesus is different. And that's why St. Justin is saying he is a Christian. And yes, he does acknowledge and accept all these goodness in other cultures or philosophy or religions. But he also agrees that there are a lot of errors and Things that we cannot accept as Christians in those things, therefore, he is a Christian. And, and this is a very important attitude that we have, you know. We're not saying don't read, you know, books, you know, about Buddhism or other religions. If you want, you can. You can. The reason, though, I don't think it's a good idea is because sometimes we really don't know what is our own teaching. You know, so if we read other religions or teachings of other religions, we can fall into error. We could kind of get misled, okay? So it's important for us to study ours first, study Jesus's message first, study the Bible first, okay? Before going into Buddhism and other things. The reason I say it is because I used to read a lot of Buddhist books, you know, when I was, uh, when I was in university because uh, I was very interested in it. Um, however, at the end of the day, I'm still a Christian because there are a lot of things that I agree with Jesus. I mean, just as a, as a person, what I'm saying is that, you know, at that time, I thought that, you know, there, Jesus' sayings made sense, made more sense than what Buddha has said, for example, right? So, but that's just my personal opinion. Of course, now I, I believe that Jesus is the truth and he's everything. But during university days, when I was doing a little bit of soul, soul searching, you know, I, I, I read all these Buddhist books and things like that, but then I said, no, you know what, Jesus is the real thing. And um, I even read a lot of, you know, Protestant books. And I said, yeah, they're Christians, but see, even Protestants, some people ask, why can Protestants receive communion? Well, because, you know, Protestants, whether they're Anglicans or Baptists or whatever, they're not the same. I mean, we have a lot of similarities, of course, with because, you know, the Protestant, you know, church came out of the Catholic church, but, but still not the same, because if it was the same, they would be calling themselves Catholics, right? But they don't call themselves Catholics, but there are some differences. And I'm not here to tell them that, you know, they're, they're evil or anything. No, but the, the truth is that we're different. And if we're different, then how can we receive communion, which is a sign of communion, a sign of unity when we're not united, right? So, yeah. It's very important for us to be really aware that, you know, not to reject or destroy others, but to remember that we have to be true to who we are. We have to be true 
to the teachings of Jesus Christ and be faithful to him and to the apostles, right? And the successors of the apostles. This is all linked together, okay? So once again, we need to remember that there are many truths in many different religions and even in secular culture, and they're all good. And we should, you know, respect them and support them, but we are Christians and we are Catholic Christians. And, um, and that's very important for us to maintain. Paul's religious zeal makes him indignant. Indignant means very angry, okay? So he's seeing all these idols and things like that in Athens and it's driving him crazy, okay? Because he's realizing how foolish it is. Can you imagine like you bowing down in front of a statue and offering money and food to statues and praying that, you know, please, you know, yeah, so Paul is upset and he's angry that they don't recognize the truth. You know, they're depraved forms of religious worship. See, Paul understands that every human being needs to worship God because we were created that way. God created us so that we have to worship God. That's just the way it is. I know a lot of people who say, oh, I don't believe in God. I don't go to church. But somehow they're worshiping something. Okay, whether they're worshiping themselves, whether they're worshiping money or they're worshiping, you know, but they are worshiping something. Okay, if they say they're not worshiping God, they're worshiping something. Okay, so it is very important for us to recognize that every human being needs to worship God. We were created that way. And so sometimes they start to worship idols and things like that. So Paul is trying to say that, no, you got to worship the true God the only God that is our God, right? And the wretched spiritual situation of people who do not know God. So Paul, what does he do? He, immediately, he doesn't just get angry and swear at them and, and no. What does he do? Immediately, he tells them about the true God and tries to enlighten their darkened minds, okay? He tries to enlighten their darkened minds. Now, so um, one of the comments that came was that, you know, many high schools, Catholic high schools offer world religion. And yes, uh, I also took world religion when I was in high school. And I think that's good. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, um, students, our Catholic students learning about different religions. But the problem is once again, our children, unfortunately, were not, educated about our faith enough because I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing uh, others. I'm not, but I'm just kind of trying to make a point, um, an observation. And this includes my parents too. Um, many, many of our parents, including my own parents, thought that when we send our children to the Catholic schools, they were going to receive Catholic formation and Catholic teaching. The problem is, is that, see, faith, our Christian faith is not a subject that you learn in school. It's not like mathematics. It's not science. It's not arts. Yes, of course, we have religion courses in, in, in high school, for example, from grade nine to grade 12, but when you study religion in that kind of class setting, the school setting, it, it becomes a subject. So you learn about it, you open the book, you read about it, you go to class and you listen about it, you do your homework, you close the book, it's done. But see, faith is not like that. See, we're, we're studying religion, even if it's our Catholic religion, we're studying Catholic religion in terms of like a subject which is, once again, once you open the book, but once you close the book, it's done, right? So I think a lot of parents miss the point that, see, the primary teachers of faith are parents themselves, and it has to be taught on daily basis. 
But once again, same with my parents. They thought, oh, you know, John is going to Catholic school. So they'll teach him about Catholic faith. That is, I think, one of the biggest mistakes that, that we made to, to believe that somehow our children will learn about faith from, from school setting. Um, I, I really believe that's the danger. That's, the, that's our failure in many ways. Um, once again, I'm not blaming anybody because it, it, it's just how it kind of all came down to, unfortunately. So what, what do I think is that when these kids did not receive proper formation, faith formation from home or from family and parents, and, and they went to the schools and they took grade nine religion, grade 10 religion, and they didn't learn anything. And usually they take world religion courses in grade 11, right? So, so when they went to grade 11, they take world religion. They're like, wow, there's a lot of interesting things in these religions. And they will say, and all these other religions have some truths to them. So they're not evil. They're not that bad. So they get confused. They get confused. And, um, and of course, there's some teachers who even you know try to say weird things i mean we cannot deny that so however i do i do feel that the reason why we're losing a lot of our youth is because because they did not receive proper faith formation is it too late it's never too late it's never too late so what can we do is first of all once again it's not about arguing and debating with them that's not Good, good approach. But I really do believe if we really want to bring back our young people and, and, and to the fact of the faith is we got to treat them as pagans, okay? First of all, we got to treat them as pagans. The reason I say is because sometimes we assume that they know a lot about our faith. Sorry, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do it that way. We should approach in a, in a way that we have to kind of assume that, that they don't know anything about our faith, okay? You may say, but they went to Catholic school. No, 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 just take that away from your train of thought. Just look at your grandchildren, look at your children and say, they have no idea of our faith. Actually, all they have is misunderstandings about our faith. You could just put it that way even. It's, it's worse, I know, but I think sometimes that's what happens. They have a lot of misunderstandings of our faith because they were taught in the wrong way or given wrong information. So we have to kind of treat them as they're not really Catholics and we have to start from the beginning, you know, very slowly, okay? We talk about the good things about the world, the good things about life. You could talk about the music that they listen to, the shows that they list, they watch and kind of have a chat with them about why some of these shows are good or why some of these shows are bad. You know, why some of these music are good, why some of these musics are bad. And you have to treat, teach them from, from the bottom what is good and what is bad and what is right and what is wrong, you know, and things like that. And you got to start talking about God and also about love. See, a lot of children, they identify and learn about God through, through their relationship with their parents and family members. So if you want to talk about God, first of all, you got to have a good relationship with them. Okay, you gotta have a good relationship with them. And if you have, you know, fallouts, well, you have to, you have to remedy that. You have to fix that. You have to forgive. You have to ask forgiveness. You gotta do something. You gotta reconcile. Because how can you talk about God when you're fighting with each other? Mm, it doesn't work that way, you see? Remember Jesus said, before you go to worship God and offer sacrifices, if you remember a brother or sister that you wronged, you go to them first and ask for forgiveness and reconcile first and then go worship God. That's what it means. How can you talk about God? How can you tell people, your children, your grandchildren, go to church when you're in fiery fights and arguments with them? It doesn't work that way. Okay, so you got to approach it in a, in a very basic way, a very simple way, not I'm not putting them down, but just we have to assume that they do not have a good foundation or understanding of our faith, okay? Okay, let's just uh, move on. So what does Paul do? He preaches in the synagogue as usual. Uh, so there, were, there was a, a synagogue in Athens too. So there must have been some Jews living there too. 
and also addresses anyone in the marketplace who is ready to listen to what he has to say, okay? And the verb St. Luke uses really means preach, not argue, okay? So what's the difference? Well, just looking at the English dictionary, okay? Preach, what does it mean? Proclaim, teach, spread, explain, advocate, recommend, advise, suggest, counsel. What does argue mean? It has positive and negative definition of it, meaning of it, right? The positive is to contend, assert, declare, state, persuade. But the negative definition of argue is quarrel, disagree, squabble, bicker, fight, dispute, lock horns, etc. Now, I know when we argue, we try to keep it positive. However, what happens is that usually, most of the time, it goes to the negative, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But Paul, he does not get into this at all. He just goes to preach. He just saying what he has to say. It's like an invitation, it's an invitation, right? But not an argument. So let's say your grandkids come to visit you, okay? Or your children come and visit you. And it's Sunday morning, you want them to go to church. You don't know when was the last time that they went to church. Go and preach to them, not argue with them. What that means is that when you go and say, guys, I'm going to church, would you like to join me? Maybe after mass, then we could go and have a nice brunch or a nice lunch together. That's invitation. It's a suggestion, okay? It's a counsel. This is really good for us. It's good for us to go and worship God, to ask his blessing. It's really good to receive communion, okay? That's preaching. However, if they say no to you, if they say, no, I don't want to go, you have to leave it at that. Because if you say anything further, you will become an argument, not a positive argument, but a negative one. You're going to start quarreling. You're just going to disagree. You're going to fight, lock horns. Why not? Why don't you want to go to church? What's wrong with you? I didn't teach you that way. I didn't raise you that way. You're going to go to hell. Okay. Invite them. Suggest. If they say no, okay, see you later. Leave, go to church. Don't be upset about it. Just pray for them. Because if you invite them once, twice, three times, four times, there's going to come to a point where they say, fine, and they'll go with. Also another way, go to church. If your grandkids don't go with you, have a nice brunch on your own. Seriously. And when you come home and your grandkid goes, why are you so late? Tell them, oh, we went to a nice brunch after mass. And they'll say, what about us? And you say, you said you don't wanna come. And they'll say, but, I didn't want to go to church, but I want to go to the brunch. And you say, sorry, it goes together. Church and brunch together, sorry. But when you do that, next time you say, you want to go to church and brunch? They'll say, yeah. Okay, maybe they're not going to church because they really wanted to, but hey, who cares? It's better that they go to church because they want to go to brunch, okay? better than when they don't go any of them at all. You see, so we gotta, we gotta be smart about this. We gotta approach it in a different way, okay? This is not a war. We're trying to persuade them. We're trying to lure them. See, that's why Jesus said to the apostles, I'm going to make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I'm going to make you police officer to go and punish and, and you know, arrest all these non-believers. No, he said, I want you to become fishers of men. What does fishers do? They catch the fish, how? Yeah, with the lure, with the net. Yeah, we're gonna become fishers of men, fishers of grandkids, okay? We're gonna become fishers of our children. We have to, okay? 
Now the marketplace is agora in Greek, okay? It's not just market, it's like actually the main city square, okay? Uh, people gather, that's the main place where everybody gathered together, okay? And it was not just about shopping and selling, it, it's about, you know, having political debates and they probably were cafes and restaurants, okay? And um, it was very famous to said uh, the market square, the city square was very famous in Athens because it was a center of Athenian democracy, but also used for informal everyday affairs. Okay, so Paul speaks to a few uh, philosophers, first of all, Ecuperian philosophers, okay, so they are followers of Epicurus, um, who kind of rather tended to be uh, materialistic, he taught that there was no such thing as gods, or if there were gods that they didn't really care about human beings, so what's the point for us to think about them, and um, their ethics or moral, moral code um, kind of stressed the importance of pleasure and life of ease and tranquility. So this Epicurean um, thinking is still prevalent today, okay? Many people, we live in a society where it's all about pleasure, a life of ease and tranquility. You know, that's, so it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, right? It's just repetition of all things again and again, okay? The Stoics, another group of philosophers uh, who were actually followers of Zeno of Citium, okay? And um, he taught that logos, which in Greek word means discourse, reason, or logic. Now, we, we Christians, we use the word logos differently. For us, logos means Jesus Christ, the word of God, right? But for philosophers, especially Stoics, it just kind of meant, you know, discourse, reason, logic, okay? And he taught that logos or reason, logic was cause of everything, okay? And it directs all the universe and lives of those who inhabit it, okay? And the reason for everything that exists, the ultimate principle, the imminent in thing, this is a pantheistic concept of the world. So there's some truth in that, right? There's some truth in that, but it's still not the same as Christianity. Stoic ethics, I mean, I know when we usually use the word stoic uh, in, in today's modern language, you talk about people who have like emotionless and they're like marbles. But no, like in those days, um, their ethics or moral code um, is that they valued individual responsibility and self-sufficiency. So they emphasize on personal virtues. Virtues basically means good habits. Vices mean bad habits, right? So they... Um, emphasis on personal virtues, especially wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. What do they mean by wisdom? This is a bit different from what we Christians understand, but this is the philosophical understanding of wisdom. It's a ability to think and act using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight, uh, or capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct or the ability to discern the appropriate course of action to be taken in a given situation at proper time. So wisdom is actually different from knowledge because knowledge is about knowing something, but wisdom is applying that knowledge in the real life situations, how to live a better life, how to do the right thing. So wisdom is a little bit higher than that. And they thought that this was very important, which is true. They also valued the virtue of courage or fortitude. Um, more like a philosophical definition of courage is basically the choice of and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. It could have a physical courage, a moral courage. Physical courage is bravery in the face of physical pain, hardship, or even death or threat of death. Moral courage is ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, or personal loss. Justice and philosophy, they talk about what is the right thing to do or what is fair or what person deserves to receive. Now, the whole argument is where, what does deserve mean? Like what does people deserve? Who deserves what? That, that becomes a big problem in philosophy, but basically justice is what is fair and right and what people deserve and they receive it, right? That's what justice is, right? 
I could talk more about justice, but today we've already went over time. We're gonna just try to finish this presentation. Another um, virtue that they thought it was important was temperance, which basically means self-restraint, um, sophrosune, or control over oneself and self-discipline and kratia. Uh, temperance is a mean with regard to pleasure. So that's what Aristotle talked about. So it's being a little bit having self-restraint and control over pleasurable things, okay? So Stoics talked about freedom uh, from passion and, and follow of logic. So Stoics basically say, don't let your emotion control over you. You should follow your reason and logic. I mean, we, even today, we understand that is very, that is very important because sometimes when we get over emotional, we make mistakes and do stupid things, right? So that's why they're saying, be reasonable. Don't let emotions control over you, okay? Have clear judgment and inner calm, okay? But it does not mean to extinguish emotions, right? But follow where reason leads, right? Follow your head, okay? Now, do I agree with it 100%? No, because sometimes we do have to follow our hearts, okay? Sometimes we do, but having the balance is I think more important. Uh, Stoics also sees fate as playing a decisive role even though it speaks of freedom. So. One of the weird things about the Stoics is that they talk about all these virtues and stuff like that and freedom, but they still also believe in fate, meaning that if, you, um, if you're born or if you're destined to be a good person, you'll become a good person. If you're destined to be a bad person, then you'll be a bad person. It's almost like a predetermination almost, right? More close to predetermination, not this thing actually. What do they mean by babbler? They thought that Paul was a babbler. So babbler basically means that, you know, um, it's a little bit derogatory, right? Um, telling that somebody just opens their mouth and just comes out without thinking, okay? Blah, 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 right, babbler. So they're saying, hey, this guy is a babbler. He doesn't know what he's talking about. What he's saying is all stupid things, basically. So they're kind of putting down Paul. Um, and they kind of thought that Paul was preaching to them uh, another kind of religion because he talks about resurrection, right? Or some God accompanying Jesus. And there was this little bit of that kind of thought. Um, Aeropagus, okay? So they took him to Aeropagus. Where is that? So it's a prominent rock outcropping located northwest of Acropolis in Athens. Remember Acropolis is the, the citadel on top of the hills, right? So just away from that, there was this very huge rock. That's where they took him and they wanted to talk to him. And it contains remains of several ancient buildings. Okay. And uh, of course, um, Acropolis is the um, the citadel, the Parthenia, we talked about the temple in Athens. What does Acropolis mean? Okay, once again, the city on top of the city. Citadel is a fortified area or town or city, right? Finally, verse 20, there were many Athenians who were interested in Paul's sayings. Okay, so they were saying, oh, well, we're interested in what you're saying. Can you talk to us a little more? However, are they really interested because they want to know the truth? Or were they simply curious? And to the answer to that, we'll find out next week because we'll see what their reaction is to Paul's preaching, okay? Once again, this is the second missionary trip of Paul. We're currently in Athens. Soon after, as you can see, he's going to go to um, um, Ephesus and then he's gonna make way down to uh, Syria Maritime and return to Jerusalem. Okay. And once again, this whole trip took about three years. Okay. Okay, everyone, thank you for your attention. Now, anybody have questions? You could either send me a chat or you could just unmute yourself and you could speak up.
Okay, otherwise we'll end with the prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray for the intentions of our Holy Father and of our Bishop. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Father. Thank you.